Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to come back up and uh, to be involved up here now in the Reading area and at Shasta for transcatheter valve technologies. You guys are all moving seats. I see people shifting seats after lunch. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I get to be the guy that talks after lunch, most importantly because if you miss any talk and fall asleep, this is the one to do. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Take a nap, rest up. No? All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, valve therapies, but it's not going to be just the aortic valve or just aortic stenosis. So we wanted to get over a little bit broader overview. We can't hit every valve and every disease process and how to treat all of them, uh, but we will go over a few things. I, I do speak and are involved in research trials for a couple of different companies, so those are my only uh, disclosures that I have there. So we'll talk about uh, aortic stenosis up front and, and foremost. That's one of the therapies that we have um, pretty well established treatments outside of the surgical realm. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, aortic insufficiency and a little bit about the mitral valve. And I'll give you just some updates on tricuspid and pulmonic. But just know that there are things beyond medical therapy uh, to treat all four valves. So we need to back up, though. Sometimes when I give these talks, I get way out of control, and I give all the newest things that we're doing to try and treat valves. And we need to back up and figure out that the mainstay of therapy is figuring out which of your patients actually have valve disease. Because once they get to people that can treat the valve disease, either surgically or through transcatheter means, that's only a small percentage. But the vast majority of people right now who have valvular heart disease are not being diagnosed. And they're not getting to practitioners who can treat them before something bad happens. So remember when we're talking about valvular function, it's really just allowing blood to go forward and not backward. And it's that simple. Now, that forward flow or backward flow, depending on which valve we're looking at, uh, is different. But that's, we just want that valve to be competent. It's a relatively passive process of blood coming into the heart and then leaving the heart. And then you can have abnormal valve function from a valve being either stenotic, meaning it's calcified, stiff, and not opening well in any of the four valve positions, or it can be regurgitant, also called insufficiency or incompetence, okay? And a single, single valve can have both. You can be both stenotic and regurgitant at the same time. I mean, those patients don't do well. Um, and you can have multiple valves being affected. And the processes by which you have either mitral stenosis with aortic insufficiency or a pulmonic valve and a tricuspid valve, they don't share the same process. So a lot of patients will have more than one heart valve which is affected, and they need more than one therapy. And sometimes that's going to be medical therapy plus good surgical therapy. And in other cases, it'll be transcatheter therapies. So if we look at aortic valve disease to start, and we look at aortic stenosis, that valve is calcified, stiff, and not opening well, there are a lot of disease processes that can bring on aortic stenosis, and it takes decades for this to happen. The most common of which can be calcific degenerative aortic stenosis as we get older, but you could be born with a, a bicuspid valve who have had you could have had rheumatic fever and, and rheumatic heart disease, and now you've got a valve which doesn't open very well. And you can have aortic insufficiency from lots of different means, either an infection or a problem with the valve itself or in the aorta itself, which causes a problem. So we're going to get to all these things, but we're going to start with aortic stenosis and the pathophysiology associated with aortic stenosis. The normal orifice, aortic valve area, is about 2.5 to 3 centimeters squared. And when you have severe aortic valve stenosis, we, we have an area less than one square centimeter. So if you take nothing away uh, from the trial other than this point for aortic stenosis, if you see on the echocardiogram that you got for your patient and you have a valve area less than one, forget everything else, make sure that patient is being seen. If you see a valve area less than 1.5 in the aortic position, make sure your patient gets seen by a cardiologist because that is the time when you can start to do something for that patient. Waiting until they're in the hospital with heart failure is way too late, okay? So a lot of times we see hemodynamic changes that go along with aortic stenosis, and the bottom picture is just a catheter in the left ventricle and the other catheter in the aorta, and the pressure in the left ventricle is much higher than it is above the valve because the, the ventricle has a hard time getting that blood out of the valve and into the aorta 
So there's a marked gradient. So I'm going to sidetrack and show you something that we don't normally talk about. It's really what happens to make that valve calcified. So we sit there a lot of times and we, we see these pathology specimens or these heavily calcified leaflets and valves and you go, oh, we just get calcium and phosphorus stuck on the valve and that's what happens. And it's not what happens at all. Um, and the process by which we can try and prevent aortic stenosis, we need to understand this. So the aortic valve itself is really uh, a one millimeter or so thick structure, but it's divided into multiple different layers. And each of those layers serves a different uh, process and a different role. Okay, so if we look at the valve on the aortic side up top and the LV side down below, it's uh, sandwiched between la layers of these vascular endothelial cells, okay? And these are really like the skin or the barrier to the middle of the valve, and they control everything that happens to that valve from controlling inflammatory mediators, uh, limiting permeability, to what gets into the cells into the middle, right? This is normally an avascular structure, but there are cells in the, va the valvular interstitium. And what happens over time is either through hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, inflammation, and trauma, is we lose the integrity of the vascular endothelium. And now we can get things into the three layers of the valve leaflet that are not supposed to be there. And what it does is it changes the structures underneath the vascular or the valvular endothelial cells. And we end up with red blood cells getting in there. We end up with different inflammatory mediators getting into these interstitial parts of the valve. And what it does is it changes these cells in a way that's not supposed to happen. It's almost like having chronic reflux, chronic heartburn, and the esophageal cells get turned into this intestinal metaplasia, which leads to cancer. The same thing happens here. These cells get turned into things they're not supposed to be. And what we get is this transition to these mesenchymal cells, which eventually put out calcium. They start making bone. They start making bone inside there. They're just doing a job that they think they're supposed to do in the wrong area. But what we see happen before that, and which is why we know that this happens, is if you look at the the valve leaflets from people that don't have much calcium to severe aortic valve stenosis, what happens first is you get iron deposition. So we're getting a, a change in the permeability of the, of the leaflet itself. We're getting red blood cells brought into the middle three layers. Those red blood cells get broken down and we get iron deposition. And the beginning of that process then eventually leads to calcification. So the blue is iron, and some of the, if we look at some of the valves that are not very calcified and opening pretty well, we start with iron, and then we start to build up calcification, and then the most severely stenotic valves have a high burden of iron and calcium, but iron shows up first, calcium second. And then by the time we figure out somebody's got aortic valve stenosis and we figure out what medications to put them on, it's too late. How do you fix a heavily calcified, heavily stenotic valve with some medication. You can't do it. Now maybe, bless you, maybe somewhere previously, you might have AS, could be your best notes. Um, early sign, we'll listen to you. So some of the early, early stages of AS we might be able to present, but we don't have the trials up front. We've done statin-related trials, but with patients already with established disease, and the question will be is if we back way up and try and decrease inflammation, it seems to help every disease process, arthritis-related, um, diabetes-related. It probably helps valvular heart disease, too, but we need to do more, more work on that. But once we get to the point of these severely calcified leaflets, it's hard to fix them. So the pathophysiology of this, once these leaflets get very stenotic and it becomes harder and harder to get flow out of that valve, pressure builds up in the left ventricle. And the way that we respond to that to decrease the wall stress on the ventricle is we become thicker, right? So we become thicker. So the ventricle becomes thicker. It becomes non-compliant. Um, we get diastolic dysfunction. We don't handle changes in volume or pressure very well. And patients end up with heart failure symptomatology. It affects the mitral valve, the left atrium, back to the lungs, and then the right ventricle. And I'm going to show you that a lot of times we wait too long to treat these patients um, because they don't have symptoms, but the heart is already starting to show symptoms and fall apart. And this is going to be what we do. So how, do, how am I supposed to follow some of you with asymptomatic uh, 
aortic stenosis? Well, we follow them for long periods of time because they don't have symptoms and their valve doesn't get critical for many years to decades. So we follow them with ultrasound and echocardiograms. We look for, um, you know, any symptoms related to it. But a lot of our patients don't develop severe aortic valve stenosis for many, many years. Valve very less than one. Just remember that, valve very less than one. So it can take many years before the valve doesn't open very well and patients start to present with chest discomfort or heart failure symptoms. But I'm going to tell you that the key is getting to these patients earlier. Because once we wait for them to fall off the cliff and start to have heart failure, what have you, syncope or angina, we've missed, we've missed the boat, right? This process has been going on for a long period of time. And even in, in the 1960s, when Dr. Brunwald and colleagues published patients, papers on patients with rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, um, once you start to fall off the cliff with symptoms, if you don't replace the valve, your chances of being alive at five years is worse than any metastatic cancer that's out there. So it is a malignant disease process that we have to treat or your patients are not going to survive. We follow them with echo. We have a lot of echo sonographers that are in the room as well, and they are the key. Um, so if you are doing echo, it is key that you work as hard as you can to get as the, the best images you can to help your referring practitioners determine what's going on, right? So there's lots of different ways to look at aortic valve stenosis. It's all not the same. I'm not going to beat you up with that, but look for a valve area less than 1.5, right? There's lots of guidelines looking at patients with classic high gradient severe aortic valve stenosis. The ventricle still works well. It still squeezes out a lot of blood. They have high velocities through the valve, high gradients across the valve, but there's other groups of people whose ventricles don't squeeze well, people that have a very small stroke volume because the ventricle is so thick. But just look at that valve area. If you've got a valve area less than 1.5, send them to see someone. If you have a valve area less than 1, we've got a problem. And let us help you figure out how to help your patients get their valve replaced. So following your asymptomatic patients, we're not very good at doing it. And I'm going to show you that. There's new, new things that we're going to do to help follow asymptomatic patients. So the previous guidelines uh, have all been based on surgical aortic valve replacement, because that's what we had, right? And there are many surgeons in the room. And up here at Chasta Regional, Dr. Mazur's operating. I'm surprised he's here. I thought I sent him a case to do today, but I tried to keep him away from the meeting. Um, uh, side note, though, but when, you, when we, have our, we started our, this TAVR program, which we have now at Shasta Regional, the biggest concern from your surgical colleagues is, oh, my gosh, now we're going to do TAVR. I can tell you right now that his business has gone up and not down, right? His surgical business has gone up and not down. Because when you can offer your patients everything, patients want to be there. And not everyone is appropriate for TAVR or other things, but they're appropriate for the operating room. So you grow everyone. The surgical business goes up, and appropriately so. Patients get the appropriate care that they need. The problem with following asymptomatic patients is how do, you, how do we really define those symptoms? And how do you figure out when you're 80 years old, am I just tired because I'm 80, or I have a bad valve problem, right? And a lot of patients just don't move as well when they're 80 as they did when they were younger. So we know from the surgical literature, and this is you know, 14, 15 years ago, that if, if you wait, these are patients that have asymptomatic aortic valve stenosis, the top line get their valve replaced, the bottom line does not, and how they do over 10 years. Well, some of the patients who didn't get their valve replaced were probably sick. But if you look at the group that didn't get their valve replaced that wasn't sick, your risk of dying is still goes up. So once you have severe aortic valve stenosis, whether you think you have symptoms or not, your mortality goes up if you don't get your valve replaced. And we wait too long to do these things. So this is some of the new paradigms gonna, I'm going to show you that are going to come down the line. A few of the things that we don't do right now is routine exercise testing, right? When I try and bring over my patient with AS and I put them on a treadmill with my nurse practitioner or PA, they look at me like, what do you, I'm going to kill your patient. What are you doing? Right? We're not supposed to exercise these people. Well, if they don't have symptoms, they don't think they have symptoms, you need to figure that out. Because if they can barely exercise or do anything and they fail their treadmill test, they have symptoms. They're on that curve. You need to replace their valve or they're going to die. Period. We've had the unfortunate experience up here already of one patient who wanted to wait a little bit to get his valve replaced. And four weeks after we saw him in clinic, he died suddenly. Right? It is a reality and you don't know when it's going to happen. 
So we do not delay when we try and see these patients. We get them in, we get them taken care of, and get them treated because they're going to die if you don't. So we're looking at all these things, and some of the novel things we're going to start look at, looking at are biomarkers, LVH, and other ways to look at this. I'm going to show you this new paradigm, which is put out by Philippe Genero, and I think when we next do the guidelines, we're going to be looking at patients differently. We're going to be not waiting for them to have symptoms. We're going to look at the, the echoes, and we're going to look at different stages, like what does the mitral valve look like? How thick is the ventricle? What does the left atrium look like? Is the mitral valve starting to have problems because of the, the left ventricle is having problems because it can't pump blood out the aortic valve? The later we wait for someone to have symptoms and disease, when we back up through the mitral into the pulmonic and all the way back around to the right ventricle, we're in trouble. If we've already got mitral issues, AFib, pulmonary hypertension, and an RV that fails, that patient does not do well when you try and replace their valve. But that's sometimes the first times they present with symptoms is when they're already at that stage. And then we tell our surgeons, hey, take them to the operating room and hope for a good outcome on the other side. And we don't get one. We go, how come you couldn't do this? Well, we're sending patients way too late, right? Our guidelines say wait for symptoms and we're waiting way too long. If you take these different four stages um, and try and replace someone's valve at that time, if you replace their valve in the earlier stages, they do much better than when you replace their valve in the later stages. So we have absolute data to suggest earlier is better, but we're not doing a good job getting patients to the operating room earlier. There's going to be some data, bless you, there's going to be some data looking at MRI, right? There's ways of looking at scar tissue and fibrosis and MRIs to determine that we've already got a problem in these patients with AS. And there's some ongoing trials looking at that right now. There are some biomarkers we're going to start looking at. And again, ongoing trials, looking at patients with troponins, different ways to look at strain on echo, combining it with MRI. And these are ongoing trials to try and say, hey, we should be looking at these patients a lot earlier. Earlier asymptomatic patients that have severe ES to determine when we should go get their valve replaced surgically or by transcatheter means. There's an ongoing trials right now locally and close by called early TAVR trial, looking at patients 65 or older without symptoms, put them on a treadmill. If they don't have symptoms, half of them get uh, watch and wait, and half of them get transcatheter valve replacement to see if it makes a difference. Are we waiting too long to replace the valves? And my clear opinion is yes, we're waiting too long. Here's a lady I saw the other day. She's 57 years old. She has a bicuspid valve. She says, I do everything I want. I got no symptoms. I guarantee I'm doing fine. I said, all right put you on a treadmill, right? Standard treadmill. She said she exercises all the time and maybe has some limitations but doesn't want to admit it, partly because she's scared. She knows if she tells me she has symptoms at 57, she's going to end up in the operating room, right? Bicuspid valve, she'll end up with a surgical valve, and the discussion of mechanical versus bioprosthetic is now going to become a reality for her. But just a few minutes on the treadmill, she already has marked ST segment depression, in multiple leads, and ST elevation in AVR. So this is global ischemia and global strain already on her ventricle, right? And remember, I'm going to back up one. Remember what her initial EKG looks like, all right? Now we look at all these ST segment depression here. I wait 10 minutes later. I stop the test. 10 minutes later, she still has ST segment depression. 10 minutes out. Her heart rate is slowed down. Right? So this is not someone that I think is asymptomatic. Her heart is not asymptomatic. So I told her, I said, listen, this is something that you need to get taken care of. Your heart, we're just damaging your heart waiting. It took us over 15 minutes for her EKG to recover at rest sitting down. So this is, th these are patients we need to get treated and taken care of a lot earlier. So surgical aortic valve versus transcatheter valve, it'll differ depending on what hospital you're at, how aggressive the surgeons are. Do you have a TAVR program? How old is the patient? Um, what surgical valve size or transcatheter valve are you about to put in there? It's going to differ, okay? The most recent guidelines. Now, again, there are many centers that don't have a structural heart program or a TAVR program, but the most recent ACCH, ACCHA guidelines says that every patient with valvular heart disease should be evaluated at a center that can do surgery and transcatheter valves with a valve team, so a discussion could be had with that patient about every option, right? If you go to see someone who just does transcatheter valves, they might just try and do that for you. If you just go to see a surgeon, they might just try and do that for you.
but one or the other probably needs the other person involved. And we know that the care of the patient goes up if you can be seen at a center that does everything, and those are the guidelines. So medical management is not effective. We don't have anything to really affect the aortic valve. You need to change the flat tire on these patients, okay? So this is what transcatheter valve looks like. Well, no, it doesn't. This is what surgery looks like. No. I did, I'm sure I did something, but I don't know what I did, but uh, they'll fix it. So I was going to show you a little video about what transcatheter aortic valve replacement looks like. Just the, the end stage, but just remember for transcatheter aortic valve replacement, we can put an IV in your leg and go up to your heart and replace that aortic valve. Now, again, you get seen by a heart team, and that might not be the right thing for you. Uh, but for many patients whose surgery is not an option, and for many patients now, based on the guidelines, if you're over the age of 65, you have the option of a transcatheter valve versus a surgical valve. We have low-risk trials, which are, have been done. Um, and we have... Okay. We have low-risk trials, which have been done, which we're following patients uh, over time. Because when we talk about transcatheter valves and surgical valves, durability means everything. If you're a young patient and you get a transcatheter valve, that valve needs to last as long as your surgical valve. So there's still going to be a lot of discussion about the younger patients about the best way to go about this. Do I get a transcatheter valve and then get surgery? Do I get a surgical valve first and we, then we put a transcatheter valve inside that valve? Um, so lots of discussions. Don't worry about the video. It'll take too long to find it. There's a video. There's a valve. It goes in. There you go. It takes that. It's as long as it takes. So aortic regurgitation. Let's go to aortic regurgitation, which is really just a, a leaky heart valve, right? So the valve now leaks. It may still have some calcium and be stenotic, but the valve leaks. Now, this is a, a valvular lesion which is tolerated for a long period of time. And it is not common for patients to go to the operating room for wide open aortic insufficiency unless it's really been infected or the surgical valve fails or... Uh, no, it, it, it happens, right? But it's not as common to go to the OR for wide open AI. Um, but remember, this is now a volume overload state. All the blood goes out of the aortic valve and it comes back to the ventricle. So the way the ventricle deals with it is by dilating over time. Aortic valve stenosis patients get thick. Aortic insufficiency patients dilate to deal with a volume overload state, Okay. So we know that if you have acute aortic insufficiency and your ventricle has not had a chance to dilate and all this blood starts coming back at it, the left ventricular pressures go up, it pushes through the mitral valve to the left atrium, back into the lungs, and you get pulmonary edema. So acute aortic insufficiency is not well tolerated, okay? Not well tolerated. Um, chronic over time and the ventricle has a chance to dilate and deal with it, um, a lot easier, a lot better tolerated. And people can deal with this for a long period of time and may never need to have intervention on their valve. So broad range of presentations when it comes to aortic insufficiency, bicuspid valves can leak, uh, people that have infective endocarditis or Marfan syndrome, et cetera, people with lupus. Um, and a lot of the aorta itself, that the aorta dilates, and we have aortic abnormalities, can compromise um, that aortic valve itself. A lot of it, it can still be related to worldwide rheumatic fever uh, in either a congenital or a degenerative here in the United States. But if you go to the operating room for severe AR, it's really just like 5 to 10% of the patients that have it. It's not as common as aortic stenosis. And its prevalence is maybe 1% of the population, aortic insufficiency. Again, the natural history is favorable. Prognosis is related to um, symptoms and LV dysfunction. So that's what I want you to follow in your patients with aortic insufficiency. We grade it from like zero to four plus. And the, the worse grade, the more severe it gets, patients should really be seeing a cardiologist because you want to be followed. You can treadmill these patients. But we need to follow different parameters. We need to follow the LV function. We need to follow the LV dimensions. Because if I send this patient with severe aortic insufficiency over to my surgeons when I've waited too long and the EF goes down, well, guess what? They don't do as well right? So if, if the LV starts to dilate 
and the EF starts to go down, and then I send them to the operating room, 10 years out, they don't do as well as if I had sent these patients to the operating room way before. So acknowledging that my patient has valve disease, sending them over to someone who can watch them for you takes the burden off of you as a, a primary practitioner, right? Let the cardiology teams follow them for you. Don't wait till we're too late to deal something. Deal with it because our patients are not going to do as well. So who goes to surgery? Severe AI and symptoms. Even mild symptoms should prompt a, prompt a referral. Exercise treadmill testing is good. Um, if the left ventricle doesn't get better or improve during exercise, that's already a problem. We should increase our EF, increase the squeeze with exercise, or we already have some early LV problems. <clears throat> so these patients also need to have their tire changed. So <clears throat> if you're undergoing coronary artery bypass surgery for another reason, uh, they'll, they'll replace the valve at the same time. So when the end systolic dimension is greater than 55 or the end diastolic dimension is 75, which again is, in my mind, waiting too long, but that's already an indication whether the patient has symptoms or not. But when you start to approach those levels, you should really think about getting some sort of intervention, right? And right now in the United States for aortic insufficiency, it's surgical valve replacement or aggressive repair. There are transcatheter methods to, to treat aortic insufficiency, but not FDA approved at this time, though it's coming. We'll look at the mitral valve here, and then I'll leave you alone. So the mitral valve is very complex. Um, the mitral apparatus itself is composed of an anterior and posterior leaflets. It's got uh, papillary muscles. The left atrium is involved. So lots of things with the mitral apparatus. Um, all these things, the left atrial wall, the chordae, the papillary muscles are all involved in this mitral valve working properly. If we damage any one of them, uh, we run into problems. So infections of the mitral valve, acute MIs, things that damage the papillary muscles, the chordae, the left ventricle starts to dilate. We pull apart the mitral valve. We end up with mitral insufficiency. So it's leakage of blood going back into that left atrium, back into the pulmonary circulation, which leads to significant shortness of breath. Um, it, we will compensate once again. This is a, uh, a volume overload state. The LV will dilate. Our effective stroke volume goes down. We're pushing half the blood back towards the lungs and not out the aortic valve. So our effective cardiac output goes down, and patients can get shorter breath, tired, and fatigued. Increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Um, so these patients can be treated with medicines, which we'll go over. So again, any acute valvular abnormality are not well tolerated by patients. They go into pulmonary edema. Um, I remember being a resident, uh, and I saw this patient who came in for acute shortness of breath, and we were admitting and we examined the patient, and he, it sounded like he had wide-open MR, but I'm a resident. I'm going, sounds like wide-open MR to me, but um, they thought the guy had just uh, having an MI, but he was in acute heart failure. He had ruptured a, uh, his chordae. He had mitral valve prolapse, ruptured chordae, and he had wide-open failed leaflet and MR, and he had to go to the operating room and get his valve replaced uh, less than a day later. So anything that happens chronically, the body can adjust to. Acutely, it does not. Primary mitral regurgitation involves a problem with the valve, and a secondary mitral regurgitation, there's a problem with the ventricle. There are many people who get dilated cardiomyopathies that pull that mitral apparatus apart, that have problems with the, the muscles themselves through myocardial infarction, ischemia, scarring of the left ventricle, which causes the mitral apparatus not to function properly. Um, people can still be uh, tolerate mitral insufficiency over many years, and it can take a long time for them to progress to the point where they have severe symptoms and something needs to be done. Now, we do have medical therapy, diuretics, keep the blood pressure down so that the blood can come out the aorta and not back through the mitral, beta blockers for LV dysfunction, anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, but aggressive low blood pressure diuretic therapy can be keys to the treatment of mitral regurgitation. But eventually, we'll be left with a mechanical problem that requires some sort of mechanical solution. So they're either going to have to have surgical repair or replacement or a transcatheter strategy to do this. Um, so patients are followed over time for their effective ejection fraction, the dimensions of the left ventricle, do they have symptoms or not, 
we follow these, a lot of these patients the same way. So bless you. So patients with severe MR, we want to figure out if they're symptomatic or not. And again, just asking them is not always going to work. So we have to put them on a, a treadmill. We have to try and exercise them. We watch the echo parameters. And uh, optimal therapy at, for these patients is valve repair of some variety. And surgical aortic valve repair is still the class one indication, uh, not surgical valve replacement. But a lot of times, patients have to have their mitral valve replaced. Even if you look at the mitral valve trials with what's considered the best surgical centers in the U.S., when you go in for surgical mitral valve repair, half those patients come out with a mitral valve replacement. So it's not as easy to do a very good mitral valve repair as you think. Um, so there are ways in which we can, we can do this, um, which we'll show you through either surgical means, which is, again, very usually well done, and there's some other transcatheter means. But you want to follow your patients, follow the dimensions of the left ventricle. Clearly, if the patient has symptoms or not in the left ventricle, systolic dimension in systole is more than 40 millimeters, you need to start getting that patient's valve replaced. Don't let the ventricle get bigger, dilate, EF drop, okay? Um, if their EF stops, starts to go below 60%, you need to start thinking about getting their valve taken care of. Don't let the EF drop, right? Here are these patients. Survival of patients after surgery, if they went in with a normal ejection fraction or without, over 10 years. So if you send your patients to the operating room, letting their EF already be below 60%, they don't do as well at 10 years as if you got them there before it was 60%. And then again, New York Heart Association, class matters, all that stuff matters. Early intervention. I guarantee you, if we, I gave you this talk in 10 years, we are going to be treating patients with valvular heart disease much earlier than we do today. We're waiting way too long. Lots of techniques for valve repair, rings, annuloplasty rings, repairs, getting, lit, getting rid of redundant tissues, sliding annuloplasty, lots of things that can be done. Uh, mechanical valves versus bioprosthetic valves. This discussion is always out there, depending on the age of the patient and the need for chronic anticoagulation. Mechanical valves can last longer. Uh, they do last longer. In the mitral position, anticoagulation is everything. It is a slow flow state with blood going from the left atrium to the left ventricle. They must maintain proper anticoagulation. If not, the mechanical valve will thrombose. Bioprosthetic valves will work. Um, but again, there's a lot of patients who might not be good candidates for surgical mitral valve repair replacement. There are transcatheter means to do this. And there's a lot of research going on about ways to repair or replace the mitral valve right now through transcatheter means. One of the ways is, is through an FDA-approved mitral clip. So we have ways of mimicking a surgical alfieri stitch, which is kind of taking the anterior and posterior mid-segment of the leaflets and sewing them together and creating a double orifice mitral valve. So the outside, the septal and lateral parts of the valve open and blood comes in, but the middle is sewn together. And we have ways to recreate that with clips where we go in through the leg and clip the mitral valve to keep it from leaking. And usually reducing the mitral regurg from four plus down to two plus. So there are transcatheter means. There are ways to replace the mitral valve under surgical, under trials right now. We're actually putting in a new mitral valve, um, not just clipping it, actually putting in a new valve. Some go through the apex of the heart um, and some are being done through the interatrial septum. So there's ways to put in new mitral valves. This is still under research right now, but the, the, I think the technology is sound. It will get better over time, um, but it's still an early, early iteration of some of these things. So they're being studied, but it's there. I'll end with a few slides on mitral stenosis and then get out of your way here. We don't see that much mitral stenosis. Um, it is still out there. It's very prevalent outside the U.S. We have some patients. We saw a patient at Shasta a week or two ago who does have mitral stenosis. Um, a lot of patients have mitral annular calcification, where the annulus around the mitral valve is densely calcified, but the leaflets themselves are not affected. But a lot of patients who have had rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, the leaflets themselves don't open. And we end up with a pressure gradient, pressure higher in the left atrium than in the left ventricle even when the mitral valve tries to open. So they get a small, effective orifice area, and they do not tolerate high heart rates. 
if you think about it, we want them to spend as much time in diastole as possible because we need time to get blood from the left atrium through the valve into the left ventricle. So we want to beta block these people down, get their heart rates as low as possible, leave them in diastole as long as we can to help them feel better. So this is just a pressure measurement between the, the, the uh, left ventricle and the left atrium, and there's not supposed to be a pressure gradient across the valve very much at all. And when there is, and there's a, a gradient of 5, 8, 10, or beyond, something needs to be done to this valve. Now, we have ways in which we can balloon the valve, which I'll show you. But what happens over time is these patients develop left atrial enlargement, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular failure, and getting to these particular patients early on, though we do not see them that often, we need to try and treat them. Okay, And they can also get valve replacement. Uh, it's, it's really hard to repair these valves surgically. They need to be replaced. There are transcatheter ways to replace the valve as well. We also look for clinical symptoms. We can follow the echo assessment of these particular patients. What's the valve area look like? What's the mean gradient across the valve from the left atrium to the left ventricle? The higher that gradient goes, the more severe the narrowing and restriction of the leaflets we have. Patients get tired. They get uh, right heart failure, ascites, lower extremity edema. We want to try and get to them before that and get this valve taken care of. Physical findings, we always like to ask this of our fellows and, and residents. Um, we're listening for this opening snap. They're, these things are hard to hear, so we get an echocardiogram to see what's going on for these particular patients. Low heart rate, anticoagulation, and a lot of these patients that the valve is not densely calcified can get balloon mitral valvuloplasty, and I'll show you a little picture of that. We can actually be, it's actually very effective in the mitral position about ballooning the valve open and, and uh, allowing those leaflets to become more pliable and get blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle. So we actually can go across the interatrial septum. We come up from the leg through the inferior vena cava, across the interatrial septum. We put a balloon across the mitral valve, open it up, and what you can see is the gradient beforehand from the left atrium to the left ventricle is high, and after can be reduced to close to nothing. This can be very effective for patients for many years. Um, this is what it looks like under fluoro. This balloon get, can get inflated into the mitral valve, open up the leaflets, and then have really no gradient left. So I'll end there. I'll let you know that there are therapies for the tricuspid and the uh, pulmonic position. I will tell you that we have now recent experience with clinical trials in the tricuspid position. And when we thought we were actually very good doctors, we are not very good doctors, right? I thought I was a halfway decent doctor. I had a patient, I took her from 322 pounds to 285 pounds, and I thought I did a great job. Well, a month after that, we went her to the hospital again, and I diureased her down to 256 pounds. I thought, all right, now we're, we did a good job. High five. We just took 70 pounds off her. I just admitted her again last week, and now she's down to 208 pounds. Just with diuresis. I've done nothing else. She was 322. She's down to 208 when I left to come up here. 208. I thought I was doing a great job. I don't know what her nadir is going to be, but clearly we are not treating patients with tricuspid regurgitation and valvular heart disease as aggressively as we should, right? She's going to weigh 100 pounds less than she did six months ago when I thought I was doing a good job. So these therapies are there. We're learning about appropriate and aggressive medical therapy, which we need to do a better job doing for all these valve lesions, okay? Thank you very much.